Tonight, President Biden is going to be delivering the State of the Union. It will be a pretty unique position for him to be speaking because I think he's going to be one of the first U.S. presidents to basically be having the attitude that it doesn't really matter if a significant portion of the country doesn't trust the word that he says. Now, I guess some people will probably say that Donald Trump was the same and that he didn't really care whether the American people thought he was a liar or not. But I do think Trump cared if people thought he was a liar. I don't think Biden cares. And I think that because of this different personality that we have as president now, it's going to actually be a study in how disunited the country is, how divided it is. Um, I don't think it's only the Democrats that are to blame. I think that you do have uh, really a terrible political culture that's built on largely this def definition of right and wrong as being which side of the aisle you're on, as opposed to the fact that the policies across the board have been wrong. You have a government that's been engaged in spending away the future of its citizens, and people expect one person to get up on a stage every year and give them something to sing kumbaya about. And I don't think that President Biden is capable of that. I don't think that President Trump was really capable of that. I think he, President Trump certainly tried, but it didn't really work. And I don't think it was something that Obama or Bush were capable of, or Clinton. Um, the presidency is a position that can be pretty lonely for people because you're considered the most powerful man in the world, but when you promise something and you disappoint, everyone points at you. And now that we have a president that the media is struggling with how to hold him accountable because they know that he's not capable. They know that he isn't really up for the job. Uh, and how do they know that? Well, they've been dancing around all of the different issues that he's encountered over the past two years that he's completed as president. So during the, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, they knew that the whole sequence of events where he was telling the wrong units to withdraw from the wrong parts of the country first, withdrawing from Bagram Air Base, for example, um, those were decisions that he made. And they struggled to hold him accountable for it. Now, they did question him, and there were people who were in the media who did question Biden about it, but they didn't really make it into a signature moment in his presidency because they were willing to move on. And as long as the country is willing to move on, and especially the media willing to move on, then a president can't really feel accountable. They can always say, tomorrow is another day. And maybe that's better the majority of the time. But when you have a president that goes through all these different crises over and over and over again, uh, ones that I've written about, and the media just simply lets bygones be bygones. They, they move on to the next thing. And they don't really hold them accountable in the moment either. Uh, that's a sign that they really don't have the answer. They don't have the answer and... They're struggling to, uh, want to, to figure out why he doesn't have the answer. Um, I think a lot of the people in the media realize this about Biden, but it's something that they won't speak out loud, or at least they won't speak out in public or uh, on the airwaves or right in their columns. But they know that he's not a capable person. Because how do you have a president that, on the one hand, is sending billions of dollars in war material and economic aid to Ukraine, but was able to somehow allow a months-long shortage of baby formula in the United States. How do you have a president who allowed gasoline prices to rise above $5 a gallon for a period of time, and then had to basically uh, fl you know, flood the supply system with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in order to um, 
in order to bring the price down. And they kept having to do that. And basically, we've been living on a fake oil economy since then. And that's not the recipe for future sustainability. Uh, eventually, those reserves will run out. And uh, we're still going to have to pay for gasoline. So that's more food for thought. Uh, how many of these crises does he get us into? And the media does not hold him accountable for it. Uh, there's this whole classified documents controversy. There's the whole debacle on the southern border. That Every single um, season, there's a different aspect to it, whether it's in the winter and there's a lot more migrants, or it's in the, southern, the summer and a lot of these people seem to die in the desert, right? Um, and then at this point, you even have Mayor Eric Adams of New York saying that there, his city can't accept more migrants and that some, something has to be done about the southern border. And then you have the issue of who are the people that are around, that are around him that were supposed to be his, um, what, what, what's the word? Basically his uh, team of, of uh, competitors, right? Team of adversaries. I don't remember what the expression was, but... <laughs> but um, Team of rivals, I think, was the way that they defined it under Kennedy. But basically, you had all these people who were considered whiz kids that were brought in as an administration. Now, it's only the media that thinks of it this way. There's nobody who, in their right mind, would consider Mayor Marty Walsh of Baltimore, of uh, sorry, Boston, who was given the job of being Secretary of Labor. Nobody would call him a real whiz kid because he never really accomplished anything in Boston. Actually, Boston is a disaster. And um, it's partly because of people like Marty Walsh, who was a union uh, racketeer. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this is one of the people that people that, that the, the public doesn't really hear about in his administration. Most people hear about Mayor Buttigieg. Now, Mayor Buttigieg is a big, um, you know, loser out of, out of the press coverage of the administration, uh, partly because... He thinks that he can simply finesse his way out of every crisis. But at every turn, you have some sort of transit issue, whether it was the rail strike that almost happened and the forced uh, labor deal that was enacted by Congress. So they forced workers, right, this pro-labor president, forced workers <laughs> off of the picket line in order to avoid a catastrophic strike. Instead of negotiating... The terms. Now, I, I'm not sure exactly what the solution is, but basically they had to uh, pull the, you know, pull the fire alarm on this one. They had to <laughs> take the nuclear option and force workers back onto the job in order to resolve the situation. Is that really the type of democratic solution that you want as a, if you're a Democrat, right? So I don't think most people would say that. Uh, you had all of these groundings of flights that never went off, right? And uh, even during the holiday season, if I remember. So <laughs> all these transportation crises under Buttigieg and the shortage of cars and overpriced cars and all of that. And, and yeah, he's considered the most visible member of the presidential candidate. And there's still people out there in the media that will defend him and say that it's only Republican jealousy that is... The reason that Mayor Pete is, is criticized at all, rather than the fact that, yeah, our transportation system has become a shambles. Maybe it was never that good, but it's really become a disaster under Pete Buttigieg when you have things like, uh, you know, this uh, sh ship container <laughs> shortage and, and, and uh, basically um, cargo shipping st stuck offshore for months on end. Right? How, do, how does that happen suddenly? So... Definitely, uh, that's the type of person that is considered a successful member of Biden's cabinet. And like I said, most people don't even know about some of the losers that he's, that he's put into those positions of power, like Marty Walsh, that don't get any attention because they don't really have anything important that they do. They, they basically show up and pretend that they're doing their jobs. And they probably have pretty bad stuff happening under their watch that we're only going to find out about years later um, or when a crisis breaks out because of it. 
And what about the vice president, Kamala Harris? She actually got a couple of pretty bad pieces written about her lately, including by the New York Times, where they're saying, well, she's not really able to uh, carve out her role and be able to show that she's the new voice and future of the Democratic Party. So my opinion on that <laughs> is, um, you know, I think I'm going to give her the benefit of, of the doubt to some extent, and I'll explain in a minute. But, yeah, she's a terrible person to, to do the job because people can now understand that she doesn't actually respect her audience. Uh, this is a person who will go to an event that's honoring some sort of NASA initiative, some mission to space, and speak about it as if the audience is uh, a group of kids waiting for a door of the Explorer video. So, yeah, that's basically the State of the Union person who who um, the media is dreading hearing from in the next coming coming years, right? They, they don't want to... I mean, they already hate Joe Biden's State of the Union address. I don't think that they'll be willing to stomach having to actually justify how insanely retarded uh, Kamal Harris's State of the Union speeches would be. So... Um, one thing I will give her, like I said, the benefit of the doubt on is the fact that uh, often the vice president isn't chosen in order to be, you know, just as capable as the president. And, and that's the dirty little secret here. Um, when you're choosing a presidential ticket, really what matters is that the person who's number two doesn't outshine number one. So that was uh, an issue, um, you know, a couple of times in, um, you know, for example, Teddy Roosevelt was the vice president. He actually outshone William McKinley. Most people, I mean, McKinley wasn't a bad guy. He simply didn't really have the outsized personality as Theodore Roosevelt. Um, you had, under FDR, you had a vice president at, at the time for part of his presidency named Henry A. a. Wallace. Well, he was such a firebrand, such a big attraction for people on the left that FDR had him replaced. And of course, <laughs> you have JFK and uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, that might be a little bit too much of the vice president outshining the president because, as we now know, um, it wasn't entirely, uh, <laughs> you know, a surprise for, probably not a surprise for Lyndon Johnson when Kennedy was shot and killed. Um, but yeah, vice presidents... You know, they're not necessarily meant to be ultimately the successor to the president. Now, they have to be able to stand in if the president is incapacitated. But the reality is that the VP is usually a person who is much more dull and less interesting than the president, right? The president has to be the person that the country looks to in order to lead. And the vice president is basically like their towel boy. Uh, most of the time, or in, in Kamal Harris's um, case, the, the towel, uh, you know, prosecutor, right? <laughs> you can't call her the towel boy or towel girl because it would be diminutive, right? So she's the towel um, truant officer, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, that's who you have basically in his corner. So that that's why so many people are not very happy... <laughs> about this uh, State of the Union that's coming up. And, and he he won't care, believe me. So Biden is going to get up there and he's going to make all of these pronouncements about all of these successes and all the jobs that he supposedly uh, created and all of the ways that America is back and build back better and whatever. And he's not even going to care that there's a substantial portion of the country that is completely against him, right? That's probably around 40 to 40 five percent of the country is completely against him and then there's a group in the middle that doesn't care either way but they don't really have confidence in him and yeah there are people who are complete partisans who you could put some big pile of turds in front of them and they would clap and let, like barking seals because if as long as that person has the d after their name those people are happy right so there's always presidents who perform terribly and yet there's still some loyalist portion that's in their corner. Um, but yeah, I think Biden 
is going to have to reckon with another issue with this State of the Union address. Now, this is a prediction that I've been struggling to decide whether I want to make it publicly. But I think that this whole focus on Ukraine and on defeating Russia has set him up for a real embarrassment if Putin is planning it this way. Okay, so I believe that all this buildup that people have talked about with Ukraine um, anticipating a big Russian offensive, it will go down in the wake of this State of the Union address. And Putin will have timed the attack, this big assault, in order to stick his middle finger at President Biden and tell him, uh, I'm still here, you can't get rid of me, and I'm going to continue to make you miserable. And it's no coincidence that it actually comes on the, you know, during the week, okay, if this does happen. I think that Putin uh, foresaw that it would be revealed this week that um, Naftali Bennett, the Israeli prime minister, admitted that um, there was a peace deal on the table early in the war that would have largely avoided a lot of the territorial losses for Ukraine. And the Americans and other allies said no to it. And they basically said, well, we're going to stick it out. We're going to try to see if we can settle this issue with Putin once and for all and not have to resort to half measures. And instead, what we might see, okay, if there is this invasion coming, this big uh, offensive, I should say, the invasion is already ongoing, um, you would see a lot of that military aid that we've sent to Ukraine evaporate overnight because I think that the Russians are holding back a lot and uh, they're looking for the right moment to cause even more damage, not just damage in terms of infrastructure and in terms of loss of human life and brutalizing the population of Ukraine, which they've already been doing up until now. And it's terrible what they've been doing. But really their message is that they will do whatever they want and the U.S. is really powerful, powerless to stop them. And uh, really, America isn't willing to sacrifice their ultimate resource, which is their own um, uh, men and women of the military, in order to ensure Ukraine's security. Which, uh, by the way, I think we shouldn't be involved there, period. Much less involved in a war capacity. So Putin knows this. He knows that... <laughs> it wrinkles the Democrats and the Biden administration and all of his strategic enemies that were not willing to go that extra step. So he's going to exploit it to the fullest and try to cause as much damage as he can. And uh, potentially, you know, I think this offensive could, um, of course, lead to bigger gains for Russia. But that's not really the issue. Russia isn't looking necessarily to control Ukraine as much as to destroy it and to show America and the West that they'll make an example out of any country that tries to challenge Russia's supremacy in that part of the world. It's really more about exacting pain than it is about um, any other strategic goals. So that's about it. I wanted to talk about some thoughts about tonight's State of the Union. Uh, obviously, they're not very rosy predictions and... Um, you know, I feel for all the people out there, whether in the U.S. or, or in Ukraine or, or anywhere else across the world, we're living in pretty dreary times. Um, but uh, I think that it does not mean you should start tuning out and ignoring what's going on around you. There's plenty of things that you can do in order to make yourself, your family, and your loved ones and the people around you uh, safer and more secure without depending on the people on TV or in the government. That's about it. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also find me on all of the different social media sites that you'll see in a second. Hold on. <laughs> so, one second. Uh, there you go. So... <laughs> You can find me on all the social media and, and video hosting sites, Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, YouTube, Podbean, Gab, Mind, Substack, Telegram, Getter, Truth, and uh, Twitter, and I'll talk to you later.